Hello, I'm J.H. Crawford, author of Car Free Cities and Car Free Design Manual and publisher of CarFree.com. This film proposes a comprehensive set of measures to address the climate crisis. Ending greenhouse gas emissions is the greatest challenge ever faced by humankind. Everything hinges on protecting our climate from devastating changes that imperil the very survival of our species. If we fail to make large prompt reductions in carbon emissions, the world we leave our children may not be fit to live in. We have less than 30 years to achieve a sustainable zero emission world, and early progress reduces the threat to the climate. Car-free cities are an essential foundation for a sustainable world, and we will show how they support the other measures we must take. Large changes are required in almost every area of our lives, but we will be building a better society with a higher quality of life. The burning of immense amounts of fossil fuels has changed the world beyond recognition in just two centuries. We live longer, healthier lives than our forebears, and much of the credit for this goes to advances made possible by fossil fuels. However, the costs of that progress have been huge, and the bill has now come due. What we propose is a win-win solution. We can hold on to the improvements made possible by the Industrial Revolution while fixing the problems it has caused. Central to the solutions we propose is the widespread adoption of car-free cities, which are the most sustainable urban form we can envision and which also deliver the best quality of life for their citizens. We also propose large changes in transportation, energy, agriculture, water supply, and governance. Although technical solutions have been proposed for some of the problems we face, these technologies don't always work as advertised and may have unfortunate secondary effects. We propose relatively simple solutions, most of which have already stood the test of time. This is Deborah Ephraimson. I am Regional Director for the Canadian NGO Health Bridge and author of Addressing Climate Change, Can We Reduce Carbon Emissions While Increasing Quality of Life? And Beyond Apologies, Defining and Achieving an Economics of Well-Being. In my work in Bangladesh, one of the poorest nations in the world, we have tried to improve the quality of life for the large majority of people. We work not only for sustainable economies, but also for better societies. In particular, our work on transport in Dhaka, a city of 15 million people, has trimmed transport emissions while also providing more equitable access to transport. I have seen that some degree of economic justice is essential to any effort to build a sustainable society. We must once again support local economies and end the harm done by globalization. We need to learn from places like Bangladesh how to have a high quality of life with low carbon emissions and resource consumption. This can actually enrich our lives. Almost all visions of sustainable cities are based on the assumption that we cannot live a good life without cars. One purpose of this film is to convince you that there are better approaches. Car-free cities offer a much higher quality of life and support the social systems that sustain our civilization. In the end, even rich people will live better. They will have less money and power, but will live, like the rest of us, in a better world. When considering most of the problems we face, exact numbers are not important. We simply need to cut emissions and resource consumption as fast as possible. We have eight major measures to discuss, so let's get right to work. First, let's look at the problems caused by cars and motorcycles in cities. There are 19 reasons cars don't belong in cities. In cities, life becomes a contest between cars and everyone else. In a collision between a pedestrian and a car driver, only the pedestrian ever dies. Drivers are isolated from the world outside. The automobile isolates the young and the old who cannot cross streets without help. 
Increasing automobile traffic kills social life on the affected streets. The noise, danger and pollution slowly force people off the street, which damages the social fabric of the neighborhood. In most cities, traffic is the worst source of noise, but pedestrian areas are peaceful. Europeans live much better than Americans, largely because they spend far less on cars and their infrastructure, as well as far less fighting wars to maintain access to oil. Gasoline would cost $15 a gallon if the price covered the full cost of driving. Non-renewable resources are limited and are running out. We need to use them for a better, safer and more sustainable transport system, not for cars. Except in rural areas, automobility simply does not work. One traffic line can carry only 2,000 cars an hour. A rail line can move 20 times as many people. Traffic calming may reduce the worst effects of driving, but even calm traffic still imposes a large burden. In the West, people know the damage that urban highways do and will not allow new ones to be built. In fact, many cities are tearing down their elevated highways. Car crashes are the ninth most common cause of death and rising fast. Fear of cars deters many of those who would prefer to travel on foot or by bicycle. Severe air pollution from cars actually kills more people than crashes. Because of cars, millions of people rarely walk anywhere. The health costs of this are enormous and will soon surpass tobacco as the leading cause of avoidable death. The direct emissions of cars account for much of the damage we are doing to the earth. The raw materials consumed in their construction cause even more damage. Cars are powered by fossil fuels and are a major contributor to global warming. Technical fixes aim to solve the problems caused by cars and some improvements will be made. Keep in mind, however, that even quicker, safer, cheaper, quieter, more efficient and less polluting cars still impose enormous burdens on the city, its inhabitants and the global ecosystem. The Achilles heel of the automobile is the space it requires for movement and parking. Technology might improve this situation somewhat, but the problem cannot be fixed. As much as 70% of downtown land in Houston and Los Angeles is devoted to the automobile, yet still traffic is jammed every day. Let's look at how cities have changed in the past 500 years. First, streets became much wider. Then, buildings were set back from the street. Next, space was added between the buildings. Then, the four-story buildings of old were unstacked into single-story buildings. Finally, each resident occupied much more floor space. The final result is an incredible 70-fold increase in the land occupied by a given urban population. Distances have grown correspondingly, so that what was once a short walk became a long drive. This was not progress. The challenge? Refuse to allow cars and motorcycles to dominate the streets. If we are to make meaningful improvements to the sustainability of our cities, the best option is simply to push the cars out. Electric trams once provided nearly all mechanized urban transport, and cities functioned well. The car-free city removes at a single stroke the problems caused by urban cars. Getting around in a car-free area is quick, safe, and healthy, and it's fun. Transporting goods is less convenient, but the problems can be managed. This one change alone will greatly reduce carbon emissions. Then consider that cities can become smaller and more compact once space for cars is not needed. We'll have room to plant gardens and for children to play. Distances will be shorter and active transport, walking and bicycling, will handle most trips while helping to keep us trim, fit, and healthy. 
And who would not enjoy a shorter, more pleasant commute or an end to chauffeuring the children everywhere they go? What is the best way to arrange a car-free city? The ideal car-free city condenses distances by mixing functions so that the total distance people travel is greatly reduced. How does this look in practice? First, we will consider areas that have always been car-free. Then we'll look at urban areas that allowed cars to push in for a while, but have now pushed them back out. Expect some pleasant surprises. Some medieval cities, such as Venice, Italy, and Fez al Bali, Morocco, have never known cars because the streets were too narrow for them to enter. Both cities are delightful environments that people love. Other cities built during the medieval period did have streets that were wide enough to allow a small amount of car traffic. Almost all of these cities suffered for years under the burden of car traffic that really did not fit in the narrow streets. Today, many of these cities have taken their streets back from cars. Cities need good social spaces. Observe the intensive social use of these car-free areas. People are not worried about dodging traffic, and it's quiet, so conversation is encouraged. Friends meet and stop in the middle of the street to chat. Many people seem to know each other. Even just a few cars are enough to disturb this function. Good cities are places people come together to create and share ideas, art, and culture. They are vibrant, exciting places to live and work. But the positive aspects of bringing many people together in a city are lost in the roar and danger of motorized traffic. Years of study have shown that removing cars greatly improves the social function of cities. In autocentric cities, social spaces are limited to schools, shopping malls, public transport vehicles, and a few other spaces. Many of these places are private and located indoors. Once the city is safe for children and old folks, we have done some of our most important work. Kids will start playing in the streets again, and older people will be able to socialize informally on their front steps. Without cars, public squares will take on new and important functions. Sidewalk cafes will sprout up, street performers will draw crowds, markets will emerge, and people will linger to watch the world go by. Walking becomes quick, easy, and pleasant. This in itself encourages social life and helps create new local jobs. The space now used for cars to move and park should be used for more important purposes, such as playgrounds, parks, gardens, and farms. Without cars, we will have plenty of space for people to retreat from the hustle and bustle of the city and more safe, attractive, and accessible places for people to socialize and play. Every household should be within a few minutes walk of green space. In fact, we can arrange green areas near most dwellings once we no longer need to make room for cars. We can convert parking lots to small parks located on every block. Everyone wants a private space to call home, and it must not cost more than poor people can afford. People need public buildings for work, education, medical care, and recreation. Medium-rise buildings that touch their neighbors on two sides use less energy for heating and cooling than either high-rise towers or freestanding buildings. Most blocks can be hollow, which provides good light and air to the surrounding buildings, as well as secluded green space. Walking will be the most important mode of transport in car-free areas, but bicycling and public transit are also vital. Once the cars are gone, there will be plenty of room for walking and cycling. We will provide excellent public transport on the wider streets. Freight transport in new-built car-free cities is easy to arrange. However, it is the most difficult issue in converting existing cities to the car-free model. We will probably have to allow some truck traffic at times of the day when it does not intrude too much. Financial incentives can be used to minimize the number of trucks entering the city. We can use carts and freight bicycles for most deliveries within a car-free city. 
Cities are the economic engines of civilization, and they should be efficient. Cities based on cars are actually economically inefficient for both the motorist and the city that pays to maintain the streets. Replacing car use with walking, cycling, and public transport saves thousands of dollars per person every year. Moving out the cars also returns precious urban land to productive uses. Car-free cities provide more jobs while using far less energy. Once the danger, slaughter, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, noise, human isolation, social damage, poor accessibility, and excessive land consumption of the car are gone, many of the most serious problems with the sustainability of cities have been greatly reduced or entirely eliminated. We don't have to do everything all at once, and we begin to enjoy the benefits of small car-free conversions immediately. Building better public transport will take some time, but we can enjoy the full benefits of removing cars from entire cities in just a few years. The challenge, build car-free neighborhoods and cities that are sustainable and delightful places to live and work. Transport consumes huge amounts of energy. Only rail systems are truly sustainable and only when powered by renewable electricity. Electric cars may have a small role to play in rural areas, but petroleum-fueled cars must soon disappear. In fact, most modes of transport are powered by petroleum, and they will have to be curtailed or eliminated. Soon after cars took to the roads, they gained priority over other modes. The solution to this problem is simply to invert the transport priority pyramid. The new priorities will be pedestrians first, then bicyclists, then public transport, and then freight delivery. There need be no place for cars or motorcycles inside the city. As for passenger transport in cities, walking and bicycling plus good public transport are all that's needed, and the energy requirements are modest. Car-free cities may initially be served by diesel buses, which should soon be replaced by electrified rail, the most efficient mechanized mode. Walking and bicycling are known as active transport. We must encourage a shift to active transport, which is safer and more pleasant without cars. Active transport is excellent for maintaining good health and reducing obesity. It's also interesting and fun. It includes a return to the use of small hand carts to bring home the groceries. The return of bicycle vendors is also possible. The change to active transport requires a return to local sources for the goods and services that people need every day. This is simply the way we organize cities in the days before automobiles destroyed traditional urbanism, back when energy was scarce and expensive. In car-free cities, the large majority of trips will be within walking distance. We must begin now to shift to more sustainable transport. We must charge much higher user fees for private vehicles. This can take the form of congestion charges, mileage taxes, and parking fees. The carbon tax is essential, and it must be high enough to strongly discourage the consumption of fossil fuels. These changes taken together must double the cost of driving private cars within a decade. This will hit hard in American suburbs, which were designed around private cars, but solutions are possible. Many Western cities are so spread out that good public transport is difficult to provide. These cities must concentrate their populations in order to provide effective public transport. This change will take decades and we should begin now. Public transport has a bad reputation. It's often slow, late, infrequent, crowded, unsafe, and uncomfortable. All of these problems have been fixed in nations that care about public transport. Public transport must be affordable. Since the collection of fares is expensive, delays service, and discourages transit use, urban public transport should be free. This has worked well where it has been tried. 
ordinary public transport cannot provide good service to people in very sparsely settled areas. Some people will need private cars or motorcycles. These must be far more efficient than they are today, which means smaller, lighter, and slower. Vehicles that are 10 times as efficient as today's average car have already been built. In many parts of the world, people in rural areas do not have cars, but manage their lives nonetheless. We need to support their independence with improved systems of shared transport. We should invest in steel wheels and rails, not rubber tires and asphalt. Rail transport is not only more energy efficient, it's also faster and more comfortable. It is the most sustainable mode of intercity transport and should replace cars and buses for nearly all long trips. We must stop building highways. Too much is being invested in high-speed rail. The usual result is that fares go up and regional rail service is cut back. This is not progress. We need those regional trains and the affordable fares. Speeds above 200 kilometers per hour are unnecessary. Flying is the least sustainable mode of transport and also the one whose emissions are most damaging because they are released high in the atmosphere. Flying one person from London to Los Angeles uses as much energy as a citizen of Bangladesh consumes in a year. Perhaps some level of commercial aviation can be sustained, but it will be far less than today. Trucks deliver a huge proportion of freight in most of the world. They are dirty, noisy, dangerous, and a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. Rail freight consumes one quarter as much energy as truck freight and is much safer. When trains are powered by renewable electricity, they can be a sustainable alternative to trucks. A carbon tax would strongly favor the switch to electrified rail freight. The enormous oil tankers and container ships that ply the world's oceans release about 4% of the world's carbon emissions. Not so long ago, all ships were driven by the wind, and we might see a return to sail-powered sea freight. The direct costs would be higher than for diesel-powered ships, but the environmental costs would be negligible. The challenge? Reform transport so that it burns no fossil fuels and runs on muscle power and sustainable electricity. The world today consumes energy at a rate that could scarcely have been imagined just a century ago. A huge proportion of that energy is generated by burning fossil fuels, which are the main source of human-caused carbon dioxide releases and thus climate change. We must stop the combustion of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. 2050 is mentioned as a target date, but this is much too late if we are to protect our climate. We have already burned enough fossil fuel to seriously damage the climate. Our future energy consumption must be far less than it is in the rich nations today. Here in Bhaktapur, Nepal, life is near to being sustainable, largely because each person consumes relatively little energy. Once Nepal achieves its hydropower potential, the nation should need little energy from other sources. Nepal must build a public transport system that runs on electricity. Private vehicles can be replaced by improved public transport. This one measure would greatly improve air quality in the Kathmandu Valley. Some people believe that improved energy efficiency will save the day. But in fact, efficiency improvements often cause actual increases in energy consumption. For instance, the burning of coal increased rapidly as more efficient steam engines were developed. It simply became economical to use steam power for more and more tasks as the amount of coal consumed by each engine declined. We do need efficiency increases, but energy must be priced high enough that people will use less energy, not more. Western governments subsidize the production of fossil fuels directly and indirectly. Without these subsidies, renewable energy would already be cheaper than fossil fuels. 
we should immediately end these subsidies, which are paid to the most profitable corporations in the world. For decades, the U.S. government has paid huge subsidies to producers of ethanol made from corn. Yet producing ethanol from corn consumes about as much fossil energy as the ethanol contains. The industry is kept alive only by subsidies. One result was a large increase in the price of food corn in Latin America. We should grow food for people, not cars. The carbon tax is the only sure way to force a reduction in fossil fuel use. It should increase sharply every year until fossil fuels are no longer consumed. This is the only fair way to deal with the long-term damage caused by their use. Even energy from sustainable sources should be taxed, as there are secondary costs of sustainable energy that are not paid by the consumer. Think of the ugliness of wind turbines and the disruption to wild rivers caused by hydropower dams. Consider also the energy costs of building a sustainable energy infrastructure. Demand-based pricing can match consumption to the variable production from wind and solar sources. There is talk of clean coal and safe nuclear power. Don't believe it. Even just the mining of coal is so dirty that it should be stopped. Nobody has successfully captured carbon emissions from a coal-fired power plant on a commercial scale. One word is all you need to know about nuclear power. Fukushima. In the West, families are now occupying twice as much space for half as many members as just 50 years ago. The per capita energy consumption has increased greatly despite better insulation and windows. These larger dwellings also consume more energy and raw materials in their construction. The only safe path forward is to reduce energy consumption for all uses. Only in the least developed nations should modest increases in energy consumption be anticipated. We must plan for a sustainable energy infrastructure of modest capacity and then reduce our consumption to match the available supply. The challenge, make dramatic cuts in energy consumption and switch to renewable energy sources for the rest. Today's miracle is that we feed 7 billion people. Bad news is, it's not sustainable. A century ago, agriculture consumed almost no fuel. Today, every calorie of food that lands on a plate in the West consumed 10 calories of fossil fuel in the form of fertilizer, pesticides, fuel for farm equipment, irrigation, crop drying, processing, transportation, and refrigerated storage. We must stop using gas and oil to grow food and use solar and wind energy to dry crops instead of burning gas. We will need highly productive agriculture to feed everybody. Good news is, sustainable methods will be more labor-intensive and will provide a better life for billions of family farmers who will no longer need to migrate to the city in search of a decent livelihood. Our food will also be free of chemicals and streams will run clean again. To save transport energy, we must grow food close to the markets. This is especially true of perishable foods, which now consume lots of refrigeration and transport energy. Car-free cities are so efficient in their use of land that much food can be grown within walking distance. We can use non-mechanized methods to move produce to market if the distances are short. Most local foods don't need refrigeration. Railways provide a low energy means to move grains the longer distances to big cities. Permaculture is a knowledge-based form of sustainable agriculture. Instead of burning diesel fuel every year to till the fields, croplands are organized once in a synergistic manner and not tilled again. A complex web of plants and animals is permanently established, and this maintains soil fertility while providing natural resistance to pests. No chemicals are needed. To make it work, our farmers will need sophisticated skills worthy of a decent wage. Our food dollars should go to these farmers, not to giant agribiz corporations. 
Meat consumption causes climate change in various ways. Some meat production is possible in permaculture systems, but meat production in today's factory farms must end. Sustainable fisheries must be re-established as they are an important source of high-quality protein. Today, huge fishing ships burning diesel fuel are scouring the oceans bare. We need a return to low-energy, sustainable fishing, possibly under sail. Fish farming must also be reformed. Modern fish farms are often built by destroying productive mangrove environments. They also consume too many resources. However, small-scale sustainable fish farming is possible in many areas. After 1950, synthetic fibers made from petroleum largely replaced natural fibers. A return to natural fibers is essential. Cotton is a wonderful fiber, but demands large inputs of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. We must explore alternatives such as hemp and flax. Wood is one of nature's great gifts and our most important source of fiber, but we have abused our forests since Roman times. Large-scale tree planting can remove atmospheric carbon, stabilize hillsides, and provide an eventual source of fiber. The challenge? Completely reorganize the ways we obtain food and fiber so that they require no chemicals and can be sustained far into the future. All around the world, groundwater levels are falling, rivers are drying up, and glaciers are melting away as temperatures rise. This is happening just as the demand for water has reached the highest level in history. Wiser water management can ease the problem. Upland glaciers store water that is gradually released during hot weather. They are a critical source of water in many regions. Rainfall patterns are changing as the climate changes and extreme drought is becoming more common. Immediate, sharp reductions in carbon emissions are needed. Agriculture is the main consumer of water. Irrigation water is often priced too low, so farmers irrigate carelessly. Even with efficient methods, water-intensive crops consume too much water. Tailoring crops to the available water is an essential change. The continued arability of land is under threat in many places due to falling groundwater levels caused by excessive irrigation. Groundwater extraction rates must be reduced to replenishment levels. In some places, this is near zero. In the West, some families spray more water on their lawns than they use for any other purpose. The car-free city greatly reduces the acreage of lawns and their heavy water, pesticide, and fertilizer demands. Vast areas of private lawns are replaced by much smaller public parks. Flush toilets are a major consumer of water. This is a disaster for both water supply and agriculture. Much needed plant nutrients are lost when untreated sewage is dumped into the nearest river, wasting huge amounts of water. Composting toilets recover nutrients and use no water. We must also recycle animal wastes. Many methods of electricity generation use immense amounts of water, as does fossil fuel extraction by fracking, which also contaminates groundwater. The supply of water is an energy-intensive process, so reducing water consumption also saves energy. The release of industrial toxins into water supplies is a severe problem that will be helped by shifting to a smaller, more sustainable economy. The runoff from artificially fertilized fields sprayed with pesticides is another large problem, one that permaculture solves. The challenge, make large cuts in water consumption while conserving nutrients and protecting water supplies. In purely economic terms, today's global economy is extremely efficient. It simply follows the principles of conventional economics to their logical extreme. 
but conventional economics has never recognized the limits of the physical world. As long as energy is reasonably cheap and the costs of pollution do not have to be paid by polluters, we can expect the global economy to do as much damage as it does today. The global economy is highly effective at making rich people richer and poor people poorer. This simple fact makes today's economy unsustainable and also undermines the social contract. Tax policy has been used before to rein in the rich and it can work for us again. The economy today depends upon excessive and unsustainable inputs. Energy constraints and global warming concerns force us to change the resource intensiveness of our economy. Furthermore, the supply of many raw materials is under stress and ever poorer grades of ore must be refined to meet demands. This consumes ever more energy and releases ever more pollution. The globalized economy moves raw materials and intermediate goods to wherever the next phase in the manufacturing chain is cheapest. The cost of shipping is so low that it can be neglected, but extreme transport-related carbon emissions are a result. Citizens in rich nations now consume goods at an absurd rate. In the USA, cheap goods from China have encouraged people to buy things they don't need. The resources committed to making and shipping these goods are enormous and a significant contributor to climate change. Most of these products are financed by debt, public or private. Today's consumer goods seldom last very long, which contributes to consumer debt. The waste disposal problems are immense and the invested raw materials are rarely recovered. We need durable goods that last a lifetime and are designed to be recycled. Following a century in which labor conditions generally improved, we are now seeing widespread mistreatment of workers who are exposed to toxic conditions, long work hours, and low wages. All this happens under the threat of moving the jobs elsewhere if workers complain. One result of globalization is that most manufacturing and retail businesses are operated by absentee owners who don't care what happens to the local people. The profit leaves the local economy, and communities are often left to pay for the cleanup when businesses disappear and leave a mess behind. A return to more localized economies will be less efficient in purely economic terms, but far more sustainable. Simply by raising the cost of transport through a carbon tax, the global economy will be forced to return much of its production to places nearer the point of consumption. This will translate to more local jobs and less concentration of wealth and power. The people who own and run things will routinely encounter local people who are affected by their actions. Local products also do not require the excessive packaging typical of products in the global economy. Most buildings in a car-free city should have commercial spaces on the ground floor and residential spaces on the upper floors which helps to create affordable housing. This age-old pattern is efficient and supports small businesses that are embedded in the community. Advertising has as its purpose to make people feel bad about themselves by lying to them in hopes that they will buy some product they don't need. This ubiquitous practice must be eradicated. News reporting is paid for by advertisers and this distorts the news including news about climate change. Global corporations employ armies of lawyers and lobbyists to make sure they pay little or nothing in taxes. Small businesses lack these advocates and often pay a higher percentage of their receipts in taxes. Tax reform is essential to support sustainable local businesses. The challenge? build local economies based on sustainable use of resources. Government is not often seen as a pillar of sustainability, but it is indeed one of the most important. Without good government, many of the changes that must come are impossible. We'll consider some of the problems and the necessary solutions.
Democracy as practiced almost everywhere is imperfect, but it is still better than other forms of government. In many places, what passes for democracy is hardly democratic at all. The worst nominal democracies are actually run by the military and the largest corporations. It is essentially how the United States is governed today. The military has a huge influence on national policy, and corporations largely control lawmaking through campaign contributions. Corruption takes many forms, but they have in common one thing. A few people get rich and everybody else gets poorer. The problem is worse than this, however. Each dollar that lands in the pocket of a politician might cost society $10. This is an inefficient way to reward our politicians and civil servants. Singapore is the most successful nation in Southeast Asia at reigning in corruption, and it is the most prosperous. Its civil servants are paid well. Historically, corporations received charters from the national government to undertake an activity that was deemed to be in the public interest. In the past half century, we have lost sight of this basic principle. Corporations today have only one real objective, to make money. Anything that makes a profit is considered appropriate. Breaking the law is common, but criminal prosecutions are rare. Before any real progress can be made towards sustainable government, it will be necessary to end corporate influence on government. The means will vary from nation to nation, but the required outcome is the same. Governments must always be more powerful than corporations. Globalization has become a powerful force for ill. Workers are losing their jobs, the environment is being stripped bare of resources, and the earth is being ruined, all in the interests of making money. This must end. In America's golden years, the period following World War II, local businessmen were the backbone of the economy. Large businesses certainly did exist, and, just as now, they violated the public trust as when they destroyed the nation's public transport systems. Still, the most important part of the economy was a million small businesses spread across the nation. Many of their owners prospered, and most of them gave a lot back to their communities. There was reasonable stability in employment, and wages were high enough to live on. In the 21st century, small businesses everywhere have been under threat from global corporations. When a large one moves into town, the local businesses often cannot compete and are forced to close. This is a major blow to the community. One of our great challenges is megacities like New York, Tokyo, Delhi, and Shanghai. Tokyo and New York work reasonably well, thanks largely to well-developed rail networks. Delhi and Shanghai and many other fast-growing cities have turned into polluted nightmares where a few people moving by car make large contributions to bad air and worse traffic congestion, which slows public buses to a crawl. People move to megacities for social and economic opportunities, which often elude the poor and uneducated. Many merely exchange a poor life in a peaceful village for a poor life in a noisy, polluted city. Governments must find ways to make life in small cities, towns, and villages attractive enough that people want to remain there. The most effective and cheapest ways are to support their transition to car-free places served by good regional public transport and by rewarding farmers for growing healthful crops without using fossil fuels. War is the least sustainable human activity. Governments must find a way to settle their differences without fighting. The Earth cannot stand the costs of fighting wars. The challenge, achieve sustainable government, which may be the most difficult task of all and which will take billions of citizens demanding an end to the tyranny of global corporations and a return to honest government. The final matter we need to consider is society itself. 
Healthy societies are both the means and the ends for the changes we propose. Nothing can be achieved without effective action by the world societies, and the changes we need are precisely to sustain those societies. One of the great risks we face is a deterioration of the social ties that bind us together into functioning societies. This is no abstract threat. Many times in history, a civilization has lost sight of its purposes. When this happens, the afflicted society usually comes to grief in one way or another. The social contract that underlies a civilization must be regularly nurtured by contacts among all groups of people. Some social contact can be ritualized, but informal contact is essential and requires public social spaces that are so attractive that everyone uses them. Think of the Greek agora, which everyone visited daily, or the evening promenade in southern Europe that draws most people into the streets. The elimination of motorized traffic is necessary to create public areas that are effective social spaces. The car-free city naturally ensures that these places will exist, and the removal of cars from existing cities leaves so much free space that we can create excellent social spaces even in the densest cities. Placemaking is the deliberate introduction of changes to public spaces to improve their social function. As space is freed up by removing vehicles, we should conduct some placemaking as a community project. Collaborative placemaking primes the pump for social success even before the project is implemented. Good public spaces help to ensure that everyone enjoys a strong neighborhood social life and that no one is isolated. Every child also needs a place to play in a natural setting. Sustainability is made much more difficult by a soaring human population. Progress has been made towards reducing population growth but much more still needs to be done. The means are well known and have been implemented in many nations. The challenge, build sustainable societies with stable populations that are based on strong, inclusive social ties. There are few unknowns in the approaches we propose. The challenges are mostly political. Nothing will happen until billions of citizens demand change. The actions that are required will vary from place to place and time to time. The necessary result is that sustainability becomes the lens through which all human activities are viewed. You can act to achieve this at three levels. Take immediate action on a personal level. If you live in a prosperous nation, make large cuts in your consumption of energy and resources. Reduce waste generation and reuse goods as much as possible. Eat locally grown organic food and shop at your local farmer's market. Save heating and cooling energy by wearing a sweater or turning on a small fan. Don't heat or cool rooms that are not in use. Replace car trips with walking, cycling, and public transport. Identify obstacles to walking and cycling in your neighborhood and demand specific improvements. Organize local safe routes to school. Install solar collectors, plant vegetable gardens, compost wastes, and save water. Express your views in print, on radio and television, and through social media. Help build a strong local society based on mutual support. Establish a collective to operate a small second-hand store that includes a repair shop. Demand changes in your city or town that encourage active, car-free trips. Help establish community gardens with a composting facility. Encourage energy efficiency at work. Ask for a parking cash-out so that people who don't drive to work are rewarded. Join your local transition towns group. Work for car-free days and weeks Call for a car-free district, even if it's small at first. Act like politics really matters, no matter how much you may hate politicians. Act together to demand legislation to rein in corporations and protect the environment. COP21 is coming on November 30th. 
ask your national delegation to include the car-free city in your nation's proposals to the conference. Street protests are probably needed to make loud and clear demands. Tell your politicians that it is possible to stop climate change while actually improving the quality of life. Tell them that this can be done while saving a lot of money, increasing employment, and rebuilding local economies. Keep pushing this message until it gets heard. Our opponents are rich and powerful, so these changes will not be quick or easy. Joining the struggle will be the most important thing you have ever done. Keep your eye on the ball, a better world for you and your children. And be sure to have some fun with your friends and neighbors along the way. When all of the approaches we've discussed are applied, we will be much closer to a sustainable society than we are today. Some progress has already been made, but it's nowhere near enough. Most of the measures we propose have already been validated, and all that's left is to implement them globally. In particular, the car-free city is a well-known concept that has seen hundreds of successful implementations, mostly small. We must rapidly increase the size and scope of car-free areas, which provide immediate social, economic, and ecological benefits. Don't give up hope. The problems we face are grave, but the solutions are delightful and entirely practical. Visit the film's website at carfree.com rfd. Much more information is available there and you can sign up for various activities. <laughs>